generally the group is talking about uh, the future of libraries as publishers. Uh, and, and the role I see for a community college is maybe not so much in the publishing game, but maybe offering some sort of support services. And, and I had some uh, catalogers uh, that helped with creating metadata schemes for a lot of the content that was created. So they used Merlot X to create the metadata schemes. Uh, and essentially they catalog the books so that they're easily findable. Because that's one of the hardest things with OER is, is locating it. At least that's what the research is stating. And all the faculty complain about it. That's what they tell me. Okay. They can't find it. Well, it is. I think for a long time, libraries have always been about their collections. And we have to move away from the idea that the library is just about a collection. Uh, we go out and we buy so much content. You know, I think we have to start thinking of different ways that we can envision uh, we, uh, that we use our operational budgets. Um, I don't necessarily agree with um, the idea of buying books just simply because it's been part of the book budget for so long. I think we really allocate those funds and maybe purchase equipment like a camera or, or a microphone or maybe even an iPad. And then we take maybe some of our electronic resource money and we reallocate it towards chairs and tables and whatnot. Um, and then, you know, there's always uh, the need to find a good grant writer and bring them in and, and, and help them uh, to create a strategy when applying for some of the federal and state money that's available. One thing is once it's created, oftentimes scholars just put it up on the web and then it's, you know, catch as catch can. Hopefully somebody discovers it. Um, Merlot X um, is, is, is an attempt to create some sort of like a framework for people to create metadata and to create some sort of like a, a cataloging structure if it would so that the, the, the material is easy to find and to discover. But um, another good example is probably OVR Commons. <coughs> Excuse me, they, uh, they, they use like a tagging element like a folksomony in order to, to, to discover content. But it's not really easy. I mean, nobody's really done a, um, a perfect job of it. And this is where catalogers come in and add value because they know what's needed to, uh, to allow this to happen. I think maybe less stacks of books, but I don't think the end of books altogether. Um, I think libraries that have moved towards the, the, the no book model, um, I've been beginning to regret that because I still think people tend to gravitate towards, towards text based. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, this is how we were raised, right? I mean, when we got our first books, they were board books and they worked fine. We turned from one page to another and it was an old technology that worked just fine. So I think that, that the book itself still um, will hold value and, and, and it has a place inside the library. But the way you get the book is changing. So we used to go to vendors and pay $45 for one copy of, you know, whatever it was or even more. I mean, we can use Amazon now or interlibrary loan services to exchange resources between libraries. That's the exciting part. So we don't have to allocate big uh, spaces to our books. Uh, we can maybe just allocate smaller spaces for the books and then make it easier for our students and faculty to access collections that maybe not necessarily within our space, they can be anywhere, uh, and then bring those materials in. Right, it hasn't been traditionally. I mean, traditionally, like I said before, we've been just the people that held on to the content, you know. But now we can create it. I mean, I, I think libraries started years ago with like multimedia suites. And we started looking at how we can start offering multimedia services. And then we started loading out equipment like cameras and laptops and iPads and whatnot. And what students did with it, we weren't con too concerned with. Or even what faculty did with it, we just wanted to be able to provide that service. But now what we're seeing is that they're taking this, the equipment or they're taking our, our services, our spaces, and doing something that we maybe didn't ne necessarily envision um, when we first offered them. Uh, so when they create content, uh, or they create video content, for example, they can create this content and then share it openly. So now it becomes, um, it, it becomes a body of work that isn't finalized. Right? It's never a finished product. It's something that somebody can walk into or come to and remix and revise it so it's their own. And the library just provides the space and the facility and also provides maybe a culture of, of freedom. So it lets people come in and experiment 
and allows people to come in and feel safe in that experimentation. Because when you're learning, you know, sometimes you have to fail. And I think if you're going to fail in your learning, you know, fail in the library. Sure, I think, and I think that's the big role for libraries as well, is helping faculty and, and, and staff, instructional designers and IT professionals to locate a lot of this open content. I mean, libraries have always been in the content game. Uh, you know, for a long time we've been known as the, the place that had all the books. You know, but it, it was really about us just having content. And we're able now to, to help people locate a lot of that information that's out there on the web. Uh, before, I think it was easy for libraries to, to be almost like the gatekeeper almost of the information. I think universities have felt that way too. They were the information disseminators, right? Well now with the, with the web and the internet, everything's open and it's all out there. Um, and, and, and libraries right now, I think, and libraries specifically, I think, have a big role in helping people to navigate that morass. Because it's oftentimes difficult to find the content and then knowing what the legal responsibilities are on when you find it. So, you know, is it in violation of copyright if you use it? You know, is it truly open content? Has it been licensed by the Creative Commons? So, and this is the role of the libraries. And then librarians also can help faculty who create open content walk them through the process of licensing it using Creative Commons. Well, I think that's the role the libraries always had. You know, we, uh, if you think of it in academic terms, we've always been the heart of of the campus, right? The intellectual heart of the campus. Um, and I think over the, the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years, not all libraries have, have maintained that. Um, and for a long time, they've looked at the institution as being responsible for that. Um, but I would argue that it's actually been the library's responsibility for it. Uh, I think we need to go out and we don't necessarily have to advocate and tell people this is what we are. We just have to build it. And then people will discover that that's what we are. I, I always say to my staff, you know, the first thing I want to do with the library um, is, is make it the place everybody wants to come. And then next, build it as the place that everybody has to be at, right? Um, because you want to you bring the administrators in um, so that they can see the change that's taking place on campus. And you want your faculty to come in so they can see what the future of education could potentially look like and, and, and allow them to maybe add voice into our spaces, add voice into our collections and, and know that it's a safe place for them to come and to start to uncover and discover what their future as an educator is. I've had great success in dealing with our faculty development and uh, our teaching creativity centers that we have on our campuses. Uh, instructional designers are amazing partners because they get it. Uh, if anybody has deeper impact uh, on courses than instructional designers, I, I, you know, I like to find out who they are because instructional designers seem to touch every single course. Um, and then also you find the faculty um, that are always willing to push the envelope and then you empower them. You have them come in and you have them come into your space and you have them make some decisions on what you do inside that space. Let them be the voice. Uh, I'm a big advocate of changing our formal and informal learning spaces. So, you know, I, we have our traditional library classrooms. I say build those that they're state of the art that nobody's ever seen before. It's like a magnet that draws people in. And then our informal spaces where our students and faculty congregate sometimes together. Uh, build those spaces so that they're flexible and they're open and they can always change. Um, and it just, it's an inviting atmosphere that the library can become. If I have a faculty member who wants to, let's say, move to an open textbook, I, I may not have them immediately adopt an open textbook mm -hmm. right away. I may then have them adopt maybe a chapter or two, just so that they become familiar with it. Um, if you give them a big piece to bite off at once, it may be too much. Um, and they won't come back and, and, and say it's too much. They just won't come back. Um, so small pieces. And then once they start seeing the value and watching how their students really engage with the open content, and that's, that's the exciting part, is how students are engaging with the open content. They're just feeling more connected to it. Um, 
I think once they see that, then they'll be excited to explore more. And this is where a librarian also comes in, because we can walk them through that process of locating the material. I'd be an active listener. Um, if you listen to the faculty, they'll tell you what they're looking for. They may not be explicit about it, uh, especially with open content. I've noticed with faculty, they're not even sure what questions to ask. So if you just listen to them, and then provide them with the guidance, uh, and maybe provide them with a, a couple of resources, and let them be your prophets. You know, the early adopters, let them be the prophets that carry the message. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that, that that faculty that find themselves inside the library are there for a reason. Uh, and I think we have to listen to what they're saying, because uh, we think we know what our students want. We always think we know what our faculty want, but I think we have to change our, our ideas of what that really means. Mm. I mean, innovation is always messy, yeah. and it always remains messy, and that can be chaotic at times, but at the same time, it's exciting. Um, so, you know, it does get chaotic at times because yeah. it gets a little loud. Yeah. Uh, people are unsure what tomorrow is going to bring, um, but, you know, occasionally buy the staff a cup of coffee or maybe have an ice cream social. Well, in each library, it will be different. I mean, some people, it starts with the library director. They, you know, find somebody on their staff to say, you know, they find somebody on their staff and they say to them, go and investigate OBR. Or they find somebody on the staff um, who approaches them and says, hey, this is something that I'm very interested in. And if the director is open enough, they'll let that individual go out and explore. Um, so I don't think it's just one particular type of library. It's whoever finds themselves there. And once they find themselves there, it's, it's, it's like a throwing a, a, a pebble in a, in, a, in a still bottle body of water. It's just like a ripple effect. Because once the librarian starts um, introducing the idea of open to the rest of the library staff, it almost becomes like a natural fit. Because, you know, we're buying all this content, right? And it's so expensive. And we know we have a really poor return on investment. Um, and what's crazy, especially in the SUNY system, is we have faculty that create the content and then we buy it back from the publisher, right? Well, now libraries, you know, we've always been advocates for open access. And when we start thinking about open educational resources, it doesn't have to just stay in the idea of like a, uh, a textbook or a journal article. It can become video, it can become audio clips, any type of learning object. The students are the change agent. When the students are inside the space and they're excited about the space, the faculty come in and they find out this is where the students are. Then they may say things, especially in the States, um, we have faculty have open office hours that nobody ever shows up at. So faculty started showing up in the library to conduct these office hours. And they realized that their students were there already. So it was, a, it was a natural fit. Um, and then when faculty were looking for a place to maybe try a different form of teaching, some sort of active learning experience, have a classroom that they can come in and play with. So their faculty colleagues maybe aren't so close by to actually observe them, you know, break it, you know? So, you know, create those, that safe environment for them to explore uh, and to be, you know, pioneers. Well, I think it's, well, any type of, any time the sea changes, right? Um, I, people who are, who, who maybe looked at their profession only through certain eyes for a while uh, are hesitant to change because it's new um, and the story doesn't have an end as of yet. So they can't see a clearer picture of what it's going to look like. Uh, and people tend to adapt and adopt change much easier if they actually can see how this is going to all play out, how it's all going to end. Um, and for a lot of um, librarians, they, they're, they're really unsure. So I think there's where you get hesitation and uneasiness. But once they become involved, they add value in not only locating and creating content, but then they also help develop what this new role is. So it's still so new that you know we we believe our role is just locating information or creating content but i think what we do is we become almost like an incubator for our faculty and, and i'm thinking about the space of the library spaces 
we become like the incubator for our faculty and for our students to come in and maybe create content and then share it with each other. And if we start thinking about it in a local context, it's really exciting just to get faculty from other disciplines to come into the library, maybe even share their student resources with each other and develop a whole new body of, of knowledge. But when we start thinking about in a global context and the role libraries can play is being these, these global incubators where we allow scholars and, and, and students to come in and take existing content and remix it and revise it and make it into something completely new. Uh, and putting that on, on, on the global stage is really exciting. I mean, it's taking the idea of Thomas Edison's Menlo Park and saying, you know, we're not looking at experts anymore. We're, we're more looking at everybody as the expert and everybody adds value to this.